On Thursday, Tucker Carlson interviewed David Dickey, the head of Jesus Campos Union. He told Tucker that Campos did not need a so-called guard card. That's why he did not have one. However, on Sunday, we got a call from a 15-year veteran security guard in Las Vegas casinos who called that a big fat lie. Let's take a look at the segment of Tucker's interview with Mr. Dickey first. Also note that he claimed Campos was treated at a quick care clinic, but this too is denied by the guard who says these facilities are not allowed to treat gunshot wounds because they don't even have an x-ray machine as well as other essential equipment for that kind of surgery. Also note that Mr. Hickey says that Mr. Campos was not taken to the quick care clinic until Thursday 11 days after the shooting. Does that make sense to anyone? So um, let me ask you a couple questions, just factual ones, because we don't know them. What was, what was his job at the hotel? Jesus is a, is a security officer, or was a security officer at Mandalay Resorts. Um, it, we, is he licensed by the state? How does that work? No. Security officers that work directly for a company in-house security, they do not have to be licensed. They don't have to have uh, guard cards, security cards. If they work for a contract agency, then yes, they do. Can you describe the nature of his injuries? Mr. Campos was uh, wounded in the left thigh. Uh, two uh, fragments of his shell uh, hit him in the left thigh. And uh, when I met him for the first time, on that Monday, uh, he was uh, recuperating. He was in good spirits and uh, and uh, looking to tell his story and and move on with his life. Had those fragments been removed when he took the trip to Mexico? You know, I was told one of them had been removed and one of them had not, and that they were going to deal with that issue at a later date. Had Mr. Campos ever seen Stephen Paddock before the shooting? Not to my knowledge. Does he still work for MGM? He still works for MGM, yes. Did they set up the Ellen interview, his employer? I don't know who set up the Ellen interview. We had uh, five interviews set up uh, yes. prior to that. I know that when I was in town, uh, Ellen's uh, um, interviewer, the, the person that schedules the interviews, called Mr. Campos on his cell phone. Uh, he handed me the phone. I took the phone. Uh, responded to her that she could call to arrange an interview if she wanted and uh, then we didn't hear from her and of course uh, after that Mr. Campos um, was taken to uh, a clinic on Thursday. But why did he skip the interviews? 
I can't speak for Mr. Campos on that. I've had no contact with him since that time. And, uh, huh. you know, I, I think, it, you know, it's Mr. Campos' story, and I think he has a right to tell it on his own. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as we were concerned, we were prepared to do the interviews. We were hours away, five hours away from actually uh, doing the first and, interview. And then he disappeared with that explanation. Do you know where he went? We received a text saying that uh, we are taking him to the quick care. So here's a guy who was called a hero because he was evacuating people from rooms while bleeding after he was shot. Remember in version one of the story, it was police officers who insisted that he go to the hospital. But then Tucker Carlson, the day after the shooting, called all the quick cares in the city and they reported the compost had not been there. So how do they change the story now? Now they don't send him to the clinic until 11 days after he was shot? So what did he do? Put a tourniquet on his thigh and then drive down to Mexico to deposit some money in a safe place? And who's we? Who was taking him? There was, when, when we left the room, we, we were having a meeting with uh, um, three upper level MGM management people. Ah. And uh, when we left the room that we were in, um, or left the living room, it was Mr. Campos, one other security officer, a fellow officer, a fellow yep. member of the union, and uh, then there was a, uh, a corporate security officer. Yeah, of course there was. MGM's there. in charge, clearly. Now we'll hear the phone interview I did with a real Las Vegas casino security guard. Mm -hmm. When I seen that interview with Tucker Carlson, that union rep just flat out lied about having certain license that Jesus Campos needed, you have to have a sheriff's card that is given out by the Metropolitan Police Department. That's a must for me to, to work in a casino. That makes and when perfect sense. Tucker asked him about the special license, he flat out said that Jesus Campos didn't need a gaming card, which is a lie. If you're going to be working around any type of slot machines, you need, a, you need a, a gaming card to Metro Police Department. And if you're near bars, and you're working near the bars, you need a alcohol awareness card that is issued by the state. So he's, he's supposed to have these two licenses, plus he's supposed to have his, his um, CPR AAD certification to the state also. That's that, uh, the defibrillator that you're trying to use the defibrillator in case someone goes down with a heart attack or a stroke. Even the housekeepers, they have a non-game card which they need to work in the casino. Even though they're not working in the gaming area, they still need a non-gaming card. But for security, you need to have a gaming card. Um, so, I watched your program on YouTube, so I thought I'd just email you about the what was uh, the interview about and how he lied about not, not needing, you know, any type of license. And go ahead, then. It's here uh, following up on the Vegas shooting and uh, some information you just got about Campos. Yeah, so I had a chance to interview some of the employees at the Mandalay Bay. I stayed at the Mandalay Bay, made some contacts interviewed people off property, they didn't want to talk on the, you know, didn't want to be filmed naturally because they'll get fired. But I can tell you this now that I'm no longer at the hotel and if, I was afraid that if I put this up on my own channel while I was still at the hotel, they'd kick me out, I'd be out there on the street. But I can tell you that I spoke with Mandalay Bay employees who know the security guards. There are 14 to 20 security guards or there were 14 to 20 security guards before the October 1st shooting. Since then, they've hired another roughly 10. They've got about 30 there now. But out of those 14 to 20, the employees that I spoke to said they, they know all of them or know of all of them. Um, some they know quite well. The security guards don't know who Jesus Campos is. They have no idea who this guy is that we're being told was a Mandalay Bay security guard who went to the rescue. So I, I know that people have talked about that as a possibility, but I can now confirm it. Having spoken with multiple Mandalay Bay employees, they don't know who Jesus Campos is. And as uh, I was telling you, uh, maintenance doesn't know this Stephen Chef. Yeah, yeah, Steve Shuck, the guy Shuck. who uh, appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show with 
uh, Jesus Campos and really looked like his handler. It looked he like really he was did. the one doing all the talking. Yeah. Yeah, Mendele Bay employees in maintenance. Yeah. Which saying sounds like they don't know who he is either. But I can also say that I interviewed someone who uh, is in security as well as someone who was working in the, uh, the control room where they have the video cameras and uh, they were put on leave after the shooting and they are quite scared because they saw some things they wouldn't even tell me what they saw they just said what they saw has put them in fear one of them has left the job one is still there but it's uh, they're they're frightened Because I wasn't satisfied just by looking at the decor that uh, some of the theories going around the internet were necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. So we sat here, had a little conversation with the bartender, and we've actually located the room. I'm gonna go over there right now. I'll be back in a minute, Joe. Okay, so this room right over here, what we found out is I showed the photograph to the uh, showed it to the bartender and he immediately recognized it as a private room that that does in fact still exist here in the restaurant there's the lamp we see okay this is for my buddy esoteric ed there's the chandelier it's a little bit dark in here i don't know if i can get it brighter but there's the chandelier there's the lcd screen this is the chandelier shown in the photo, and this seems to be the table that Jesus Campos and his friends from the uh, Union for Security Guards. Yeah, it is, it's really dark, but I'm telling you, I'm looking at it, I can see it. It's, I'm in the steakhouse, I checked it out. That aspect of the photograph seems legitimate. Thank you both for being here, and uh, first of all, how are you both doing? I'm doing better each day, uh, slowly but surely, just uh, healing physically and mentally. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine that, that you relive that a lot. Yeah, and how are you doing, Stephen? Definitely, it's definitely hard uh, as each day passes, though. Uh, we're working to, to get over this. Okay, so Jesus, you're the security officer, and uh, and uh, and you were called to check on a door that was. I guess when a door is left open for a certain amount of time, you're you're supposed to go check on it, right? Yes, we got notifications, making sure that uh, uh, to secure them, or if they've already been secured, just uh, making that uh, 
that check on the doors. Okay, so you were going up the fire escape to get there? Uh, via the stairwell. Mm -hmm. um, I was coming from the 31st up to the 32nd. Right. Uh, when I approached the door, uh, it didn't open, and it, it was blocked off, so I had to reroute. Um, I Is that a normal thing, that the door at the fire escape, or the stairwell would be blocked off? No, they're always supposed to remain open. Right. And so, um, after I would drop down and then came back through the hallway, um, and then I approached the room, got into the door, uh, there was a metal bracket holding the door in place. Right, so what we're talking about here, just so everybody's clear, okay, so this is where the, the hotel room was, where the shooter was. This is the stairway, where, and this door here was blocked, and you didn't know that till you came up in the, in, through the elevator and went through this door and saw that there was something blocking that door. And, and when you saw that, did you think, that's weird, why would somebody put brackets on a door? Yeah, that was, that was just uh, out of the ordinary. It's that was the beginning? Normal. Yeah. Okay, and then you walk out of this, and this just slammed? Um, well, when I was in between that area, I was calling uh, security dispatch to get transferred to engineering. Uh, they didn't know anything about it, so uh, they dispatched an engineer to uh, go uh, verify what that was. Um, That's when you got called? Yes. Okay. And at that time, I heard uh, what I assumed it was drilling sounds, and I, I believe that they were in the area working somehow. So you thought the drilling, it, they were gunshots, but you thought it was just drilling sounds? At first, uh, I think it was just drilling sounds. Right. So then, at what point did you get shot? What happens here? Um, as that door is closing and it's so heavy, uh, it'll it'll slam. I'm walking down this way, and I believe that's what uh, caught uh, the shooter's attention. Um, as I was walking down, um, I heard rapid fire, and at first I, I took cover. I felt the burning sensation. I went to go lift my pant leg up and I saw the blood. That's when I called it in on my radio that shots have been fired. And I was gonna say that I was hit, but I uh, got all over my cell phone just to clear that radio traffic for they can coordinate uh, the, the rest of the call. So, so, it, so he shot, you didn't even know, he shot through this door, right? Yeah, from behind the door. I didn't know how he was shooting. Yeah. Uh, but he shot out. Right, so you didn't even know it was coming from here. So it's Steve, it's Steve, at this point, so you're called up, you just think that you're coming to look at a door that's been blocked in the firewall, right? Yeah, I, I didn't think anything uh, out, of, out of the ordinary at the time. It came from a higher floor, it came down on a different hallway, a uh, service elevator, and I walked out and rounded the corner from the 100 hallway, and that's when I, you know, it was quiet at this time. The doors are set back, and you can see in that about a foot. Jesus was uh, towards the end of the hallway, but I didn't I didn't know at that time. I thought I saw someone uh, like pop out of the cubby, and I kept walking. And you know, once I got more than halfway, is when I saw Jesus, and I started to hear shooting. And I thought at the time I didn't know it was shooting. I thought it was a jackhammer. And, you know, as an engineer, I'm like, we're not we're not working up here this late at night. We wouldn't be doing that. Right. And it was. I believe outside it wasn't in the hallway yet, and that's when Jesus he uh, he leaned out and he said, "Take cover, take cover," and yelled at me. And within milliseconds, if he didn't say that, I, I would have gotten hit. Because he was still shooting, so so you would have been hit had he not told you. Yeah, it wasn't even fully in cover, and they were passing behind my head, and I could feel pressure. You could feel a pressure going past you, just even being out of the way. Yes. And were, were like, were guests coming out of the doorways? Uh, there was a female that uh, came out, and I told her to go back inside. It wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after, that's when Steven was approaching, and I told him to stay back and get cover, um, and that's when more rounds were dispersed. Right. Wow. So, and, and I mean, it really, he saved your life. And he saved the, also the woman that came out of the, the door to, to go into the hallway. Um, so, I know, that you, first of all, you know, thank you so much for being here. And, and I know that you've had so many people asking for you to tell the story and to talk about this. And I understand your reluctance because you just want this to be over. So you're talking about it now and then you're not going to talk about it again. And I don't blame you because why we live this over and over again. 
but it's helpful for people to understand what a hero you are because you being shot in the leg saved so many people's lives and instead of you just getting out of there you saved Stephen's life you saved that woman's life and who knows how many other people and uh, so we just wanted to celebrate you that's why you're here today thank because you. we want to thank you for what you've done even after this happened uh, instead of going to the hospital you stayed to help the police and give them all the information they needed to piece these things together and uh, and also what what else did you want to mention I just want to mention all the people that assisted that night, uh, whether it was Metro, the FBI, uh, the community especially coming out together to help everyone in need, uh, the first responders, um, even the people that got called in to assist in the hospitals, and just everything is puts pieces together on how everyone came together to help that night, even in the darkest hour. Yes, there were a lot of people that, that showed up to help. Um, all right, and Stephen? Definitely, I want to thank the first responders and people on the ground at the show helping helping each other out. I mean, I think the acts of humanity were, were uh, major that night, and I want to thank Jesus again my, from my family and, and all my friends and everybody for, for saving my life. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's uh, really, you did, I, I don't know if you're taking all that in, and I know, like you said, it's, it's hard, you think about that a lot, and you did, you saved people's lives. Um, and we, of course, wanted to give you money, we wanted to, and you both were very, very uh, specific, you said you don't want money, you don't want money at all, so you're not getting any money, all right? So, that's, we're not going to give you money. But, but Stephen, your favorite team is the Colts, and you've never been to a game, so the NFL is flying you to meet the team and get VIP tickets, so you're going to go see the Colts, all right? All right. And, uh, and then also, it's over here. Okay, um, also, this is, you're a fan of the Oakland Raiders, and Shutterfly is gonna give you season tickets when the team goes to Las Vegas. You're gonna be able to see them. Um, also, we know it's really important for you to, uh, that everyone is recognized. So, Shutterfly uh, cares about supporting communities, so it's gonna make a donation of $25,000 in your name to the GoFundMe page that's dedicated to helping victims of the shooting. Um, Thank you. For more information on how you can help the victims of Las Vegas shooting, go to our website. October 1st, 2017, Mandalay Bay security officer Jesus Campos is on a routine security check, assigned to a room alarm on the 32nd floor. This was the last call of my night. You were heading home in your head. And October 1st, 2017, Mandalay Bay security officer Jesus Campos is on a routine security check, assigned to a room alarm on the 32nd floor. This was the last call of my night. You were heading home in your head. In my head, I was home free after this. He has no idea he's about to become an accidental hero on what would become one of the most horrific nights in American history. As shown in this rendering provided exclusively to ABC News by MGM, once on the 30th floor, he takes the stairs up to the 32nd, but finds the exit door jammed. So he walks up to the elevator and takes it back down. When did something seem off to you? Uh, when I noticed the metal L bracket that was secured, that hold the door secured. That bracket strategically placed there by a man staying in the suite just a few feet away. I didn't know what was going on, just simply because that's not normal. I had a call our security dispatch. I was transferred to engineering dispatch. 
as he walks back into the hallway to check that room alarm. Turns out a nanny a few doors down left their door ajar. He hears a strange noise coming from that suite. I thought it was drill noises. Like drilling? Drilling. The massacre has just begun. Across the street, just moments before, Jason Aldean had taken the stage. Meanwhile, Stephen Schock, an engineer, is riding an elevator to the 32nd floor in response to Campos's earlier call about that L bracket. Pushing his maintenance cart, he walks out of the elevator and straight into danger. I started to hear the shooting out towards the crowd. Well, I didn't know that at the time. I had no idea what was going on at the time. What did it sound like to you? It sounded like a jackhammer because you never expect to hear something like that. I noticed him. I said, get cover. It's not safe. At that moment in time, there was more rounds being dispersed. Suddenly, Shuck himself is under fire. Something hit me in the back as I was jumping into cover. At the time, I was like, oh, you know, I might be shot. Someone's firing a gun up here. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. Those men from the security office hear Shuck's alert and hustle towards the elevators. I thought if I don't come out of this hallway alive, I wanted to communicate for Metro and first responders to get up there because this is where the shooter is. Back on the 32nd floor, Campos, who is unarmed, continues walking down this hallway. He passes a room service cart that the shooter is rigged with surveillance cameras. It's either that or the sound of the stairwell door closing that alerts the shooter. He fires through the door and at Campos. I was struck and I went to get cover. I had to take a moment to realize what was going on. Suddenly you're under fire. Yes, I went to go lift up my pant leg and I saw the blood coming down. Campos takes cover in this doorway alcove. There's about a two feet indent. It's enough to lean back and stay back. Three, one, two. He radios for help. Hey, there's a fire in uh, 32, one, three, five. The shooter turns back to the concert goers below and fires over 250 more rounds in the next four minutes. Firing a gun up here. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. Control units responding to 32. Inside the Mandalay Bay, Stephen Shuck, the engineer pinned down on the 32nd floor with security guard Jesus Campos, have alerted authorities to the shooter's location. Watch for weapons and the people come. Since the night of October 1st, the story of what happened in this hallway on the 32nd floor has only been talked about, never seen until now. Jesus was coming here to check this door, which had been left ajar by a nanny who wanted to check on the kids across the hall. Chunks of wall are missing because it's been taken out as evidence because shrapnel and bullets were flying down this hallway, shot from all the way in the other end. And as we get closer to where the shooter was hiding out, you can see more of the debris, more of the drywall, more of the soot 